at uh, RNA CPAs. I'm, a, I'm an actual shareholder here, uh, and I work in the tax division. I've been at RNA for the past uh, 10 plus years, and you know, uh, I get uh, I get to talk about taxes, which I I, I enjoy. Everyone else um, hates, so I guess that's some job security for myself. Uh, a little bit about today, just some forms that we're going to talk about, some deadlines, uh, what we should be looking for, what you should be looking for going forward. Um, you know, employee uh, wage forms, non-employee compensation, kind of the subcontractors forms, and the other miscellaneous forms. Uh, those are all those 1099 miscellaneous forms that everyone's been receiving or sending out, and then also some tax returns. So. Uh, regarding the fourth quarter annual payroll employees, if any of you have uh, employees, hopefully um, you processed your wages and processed your payroll taxes because for federal, those were due on January, January 15th, um, or hopefully you're smart enough and leave it up to a professionals like ADP or paychecks. Or, or a CPA or other type of a bookkeeper to process those. But which the forms, the actual payroll kind of fourth quarter and annual forms are due on January 31st. You need to get them in the mail by January 31st. Those are forms 941. These are your employer's quarterly federal uh, tax returns. These, these detail out the social security wages and taxes, the Medicare wages and the federal withholdings from each employee. In addition, which is an annual form, is that form 940. This is your federal unemployment tax form. Uh, you pay it once a year. Um, if, you, if you file with ADP or Paychex, they have paid the taxes and filed these forms throughout the year uh, on a quarterly basis, most likely. Uh, if you work with a bookkeeper or you do them yourself, uh, you file manually at the end of the year by January 31st. To finish out those, the Form W-2s need to be issued and mailed to your employees by the end of the month. January 31st is your deadline to get that out. The Form W-3 is just your transmittal. So Form W-2s and W-3s do not get submitted to the IRS. They actually get submitted to the Social Security Administration who then forwards on specific information onto the IRS. Those are your federal forms. Your Arizona forms are forms, uh, your Arizona quarterly withhold, withholding tax. That needs to be sent in. Uh, if it's over $500, you need to pay, make that payment by the end of, I think by the, I think that payment I might actually be due on the 25th, but that if it's over $500, you need to make that electronically. You have your Arizona form UC018, which is your, your Department of Economic Security, unemployment, state unemployment tax. And then your uh, form A1R, this is just a reconciling form that details out by quarter, everything you reported on your Arizona quarterly withholding taxes. So these are pretty much all of your federal and state. Why I should speci specify state, I mean Arizona only, there are California uh, payroll forms or any other state payroll forms that if you have employees and nexus in those states, you should be filing those. Um, and if you want to understand nexus, easy way to think about it uh, without pulling your hair out is if you have an employee in that state uh, that you pay wages to, um, or you have a brick and mortar uh, manufacturing plant or some other type of building in that state, you, you pretty much have nexus. There's a lot of, uh, there's a sales requirement, but each state is different and it's uh, getting a little more difficult to track all that with the new Wayfair case. I shouldn't say new, fairly old. Um, up next is a lot of your non-employee compensation. So this is a 10 form 1099 NEC, NEC, non-employee compensation. This is for all your subcontractors. So originally, a few years ago, everything used to be reported just on a 1099 miscellaneous where they would have two different due dates for the same form, which is just 
It's a little odd, but hey, it's the government. What do you expect? So they decided to separate it out because the majority of 1099s are usually for subcontractors and non-employee compensation. Those forms are due by the end of the month, January 31st. You need to get those sent out to your subcontractors and you need to submit them. Then you have your other miscellaneous items, Form 99, 1099 miscellaneous. These are for, let's say, interest that you've paid uh, to uh, individuals. You can file that rent. Or main, this is where you're pretty much reporting your rent that you're paying um, and also other income. So those are the main items, our legal fees too, that you're gonna be reporting through here. Legal fees, I mean legal settlements. Uh, if you're paying legal fees through to an attorney, those would go on 1099-NEC. Uh, the nuances of the 1099-NEC or 1099 miscellaneous is that these have to be cash or check for business services that are paid over $600. There's a few other little tweaks in there, but just for a quick kind of standard for everyone, if you pay somebody $600 for services through your business uh, by cash or check, you need to issue a 1099. So what happens if you pay them through, let's say, AHC or some other third-party electric transaction? You don't need to because technically you should be receiving a third-party statement that should be filing those um, that should be filing with the IRS, the 1099-K, kind of like a credit card statement if you receive payments, stuff like that. So uh, if, if you want to not deal with uh, filing any of these, make sure you pay everyone with the credit card. It, it, easy enough, right? All, all your subcontractors want, want a credit card payment. Uh, and then the Form 1096 Sorry, within the 1099 miscellaneous, you have two different due dates. If you paper file the 1099 miscellaneous, they need to be submitted to the IRS by February 29th. The end of February or 29th, 28th, depending on leap year. Uh, and then um, if you're doing filing them electronically, uh, you would pay, you need to submit those by the end of March, March 31st. Um, there have been some quick questions. Let me try to get to those questions really quick regarding the 1099. Um, I think if I try to get to them. Nate, Nate, you can continue yeah. with the presentation and then we'll just uh, get to the questions later when you're done. Okay, easy enough. Uh, and then the 1096 is just a transmittal, summary transmittal form that pretty much details the, the total amount of, you know, 1099 NEC, non-employee compensations that you're filing or rent uh, or interest, stuff like that. So you're kind of dealing, this is uh, a lot of times with small businesses, you, you're usually dealing with small, with subcontractors and this is how you're going to need to issue them. Another little uh, wrinkle in the 1099-NEC or 1099 miscellaneous is that if the uh, vendor is, a, is an S-corp or a C-corp, uh, you don't need to issue them a 1099. But if they are an LLC taxed as a partnership or an individual or a sole proprietor, then you need to issue them a 1099. That is why I didn't put it on here and I should have, my apologies, is that every subcontractor that you're paying over $600 in cash or checks, you should be getting a form W-9 signed from them, or at least their information uh, at the very least. And that is detailing out their, their name, how it should be on the 1099, their address, and how they specifically they are taxed. If they're if they're an LLC, are they taxed as a as a disregarded entity, as a sole proprietor, a C corp, or an S corp? You know, this is the form that's really going to help you determine if you need to file an actual 1099 for them or not. And the the 1099 NEC are for 
uh, services. You don't need to issue any 1099s if you are just buying goods from, uh, from a subcontractor, an LLC, or anything like that. So these are services. So these would be professional services, uh, repair, if you have a handyman coming in, fixing up uh, the, the building or anything like that. So services only. Goods, you don't need to um, issue a 1099. So we are, uh, those are the main ones. The, the, the big one that a lot of people mess up and kind of have issues with because they, they most likely paid their subcontractor throughout the year and they haven't talked to them since December and you might not be doing a lot of business with them. And in January, you're trying to contact them to get, to, get a W-9 signed by them and they won't return your call. For the IRS, if this happens, as long as you can document that you set, you put a, a good faith effort in gathering that information in order to file a correct 1099 for that year, they'll let you slide. But going forward for the current year, if, they, if that subcontractor, whoever wants a check for payment, you, you better be getting the W-9 signed by them and say, hey, I would love to give you a check, but I need that W-9 signed and back before I can even issue one. Because if they don't fill out a W-9 and give you their information, technically you down the road would have to uh, withhold about 35% and, and then pay the IRS that amount and then they would have to file a tax return to get that back. A lot of little weird things that go on with these 1099s. Uh, non-employee compensations, but it's a way for the government to try to uh, try to keep these uh, sole proprietors and these uh, partnerships kind of trying to make sure that they're reporting all the income that they're receiving. So um, that is regarding those. So those are the main ones that are due right now. So if you haven't got to them, uh, you should probably start getting to it. Uh, you know, over the weekend, uh, you can have some fun um, dealing with that. Uh, regarding the tax returns, you have your pass-through tax returns and then your, your non-pass-through tax returns, depending on how you have set up your, your entities, if they're LLCs um, or incorporations or stuff like that. So your pass-through tax returns, which are due on 315, or you can get an extended due date of 915. These are your, your partnerships, your Form 1065 and your S corporations. You have to file an S corp election in order to get S corp treatment. Um, you, you might say, oh, it's, I'm just gonna file an 1120S. And if you do not file the Form 2553 to elect to be an S corp, then uh, the IRS most likely three years down the road will finally notice that you never filed one properly and start sending you notices. And what they can do is require, disallow the S Corp return and then make you amend your personal return. Or if it's a C Corp, a C Corp return and pay back taxes. So it's, uh, it, I've seen it happen um, more than once. Uh, so this is something that if you are an S Corp, make sure that you have a, a valid S Corp election that has been accepted by the IRS. Um, those are your pass-throughs. So you do not pay any taxes. I should say no federal taxes um, on those pass-through entities. Uh, you may have to pay state taxes depending on uh, jurisdictions and what states you're in. Uh, some of these um, states will tax the pass-through entities because they need help getting money into the into those states. And then your non-pass-through uh, tax returns are your your U.S. corporation tax returns, so your 1120s, and then your 1040s. So if you're running your business as an LLC that you you set up as a sole proprietor, you're just reporting everything on a Schedule C. Your, your income and expenses on a Schedule C of your 1040. That's perfectly fine. And if your income is not, if your 
taxable net income is not at a certain level, then I would say that that's the best route to go to save you taxes and fees. The cost of turning a disregarded LLC that you're reporting as a sole proprietor into an S corp and all the associated 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 <clears throat> can't talk right now uh, fees that deal with payroll and filing that S corp return uh, the, it, the the benefits don't outweigh the cost. So um, I've done numerous uh, analysis analyzes. I, yeah, like English is not my best language. Um, I don't know what is my best language. You could you, you could talk to Phil later about it. He he might let you know. But it, normally around the break even point to where the the cost uh, the benefit outweigh the cost for sole proprietors to become an S corp is usually around the ninety thousand to a hundred thousand dollars of taxable income within that business. That's what I've seen based off of. Uh, how about based off the clients that I've worked with and we've made that election point. So um, with those, the, the pass through entities, those are where you would receive a K-1 that you would eventually report on your 1040. So um, the main point that I would really like to get across uh, today is that use a professional. Um, everyone I'm sure is fantastic at what they do, innovating, uh, you know, research and development. Um, you, you might not be the best at taxes. It might not be RNA that you use, but I would highly recommend use a professional for a lot of these tax returns um, and, and forms that you need to file just because it, it can get tricky and it can be a little confusing. And it, I've seen a lot of small businesses get in hot water with the IRS or the state because they kind of, uh, you know, they didn't file it right. They, fought, they, they were filing the wrong return for the past five years and it's finally catching up to them. And they finally, you know, it's gonna cost you in the long run um, to fix something instead of just going to a professional uh, from the get go and asking for help because um, it's the, that's what they do. I'm not gonna try to do a tooth extraction on myself to try to save a few bucks. I'm gonna to go to a dentist to make sure it's done correctly or else I, I, I'd be you know, deformed and hurt for the rest of my life.